Good morning. I'm glad you're here. Come on, let's stand up. We're going to sing about the Lord's goodness in our lives, what He's done. We get to worship Him this morning. Let's sing this together. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Oh, my praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. His grace rewrote my story, and I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters, born with blood and washed in water. Yes. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. You believe that? Come on. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. His grace here wrote my story, and I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'll testify. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. As long as there's breath in our lungs, He still has a plan for us. Let's sing this together. If I'm not dead, you're not dying. But greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not dying. But greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not dying. Because greater things are still to come. Oh, I testimony from death to life His grace you wrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony oh I'm alive this is my testimony from death to life His grace you wrote my story I'll testify Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony. Let's sing this old hymn together. I sing the mighty power of God. I see the mighty power of God that makes the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and build the lofty skies. I see the wisdom that ordained the sun to Of the Lord that filled the 
words. Sing of his glory. There's not a print or flower below but makes thy glories known. And then clouds arise as tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care. Everywhere. And everywhere that we hear, thou art our present there. The name is power. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Great way to start our Sunday, great way to start our week. How about before you are seated, turn around, shake someone's hand, tell them you are glad to see me this morning for worship. Good morning, everybody. Uh, me and Corey are going to sing a duet. Here we go. You're going to love this so much. No, we're not going to do that. I'm just kidding. No, you don't want that. Um, but I, uh, I am excited to welcome you today. My name's Tommy. I get to be one of the pastors here. And if you haven't met Corey, he's our ministry's pastor. And um, honestly, we're just so excited to get around God's word and to sing and to pray and to learn all these things. But to to be able to do that with you is a massive gift. And so if you're brand new today, we just want you to feel at home. And I just wanna invite you to connect in any way that you feel comfortable connecting. So there's a connect card in the seat back right in front of you. If you wanna grab that and even look it over, you can fill it out. Let us know how to pray for you. Let us know if you've got questions, anything that's on your mind and heart. Uh, we wanna know it. You can scan a QR code if you'd rather do it digitally. But just one request, before you head out today, um, out the doors and to the right, there's going to be some folks out there with some, some uh, boxes. They're just gifts that we want to give you as a first-time guest. And so definitely please bless us by connecting with us and allowing us to connect with you in any way you see fit. But also bless us by taking one of those gifts. It's just a way for us to say thank you for being here today because it really is a privilege to host you. So we're glad that you're here. Um, also, one thing that, that maybe is a little different today, a little new, we do this audio podcast of all the sermons here. We upload it every week. Um, but one of the things that we do every few months is if there's something pertinent for that day, that time, um, uh, that time frame, we want to post an additional resource, an episode for your benefit. And so this morning, uh, we launched an episode on faith and politics. And so if you see this upcoming election coming and you're like, Tommy, I just don't know what to do. How does my walk with God actually affect politics? And how do I view things like that? What does it mean to be a good citizen? I'm not saying that the conversation Corey and I have on that episode is going to answer every question you got. But I definitely feel led by the Lord to just help you know how to navigate that biblically. So if you want to scan that QR code or if you just want to find a TDF Nashville podcast on any of those sites, then please do listen to it. Um, let's interact over it because maybe, Lord willing, it's exactly what you need these days to take the next steps uh, that you need to take in your own journey with Jesus. So. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love for you to check out that podcast. Um, another exciting thing that we have that's coming up that uh, I'd love to share with you is uh, to give you a little bit of history first. So two years ago, we did something at, at TDF uh, that we haven't done before, um, and it was called the Outward Offering. And what we wanted to do is, is we just felt led by the Lord to, to take uh, one week out of the year uh, of our tithes and offerings and, and use that for something outside of, of the ministries of the Donaldson Fellowship, whatever opportunity or project that may be. So two years ago, what we did is we partnered with um, our local public schools right here on McGavick Pike, so McGavick High School, uh, Two Rivers uh, Middle School, and then Pennington Elementary. And we were able to, to bless their, their staff, their faculty, even some, some individual families in those schools. Uh, last year, we partnered with the Next Door Recovery and it's a national-based organization that helps ladies who go through very difficult, challenging times, specifically addictions. Um, and so we did that last year. And so what we want to do for this year for our outward offering is, is kind of pivot a little bit. We were trying to pray about and think about uh, what could this next opportunity potentially be. Um, usually our outward offering is at the end of the year in, in December. Um, but we wanted to move it forward um, because what we want our outward offering to go to this year is the hurricane relief victims um, in East Tennessee. 
And so we know that uh, through those, those storms that came through just really um, devastated uh, a lot of areas across our country. But specifically in East Tennessee, we've, we've identified um, one wonderful healthy church that was very much uh, affected by this storm. And then three families, uh, specific families in that church who have pretty much lost everything. Um, so you'll notice that on November 3rd, two weeks from today, uh, we'll have our offering where everything that comes in for tithes and offerings that is undesignated uh, will go to these efforts of, of blessing these families, of blessing this local church. And uh, it's something that we're just uh, super excited about because we know that um, there's the need is great and, and we may not be able to meet the entire need of everybody who, who was affected by the storm, but we know we can do a little bit and we know that, that God can make much of a little bit. And so we just pr uh, ask that you pray about it uh, and that you consider just jumping a part of this uh, outward offering that's coming up in two weeks. Yeah, and just to be transparent about everything these days, um, we have debated and prayed over it and tried to work through, um, is this the right time for us to do an outward offering? Because we haven't even been able to be blessed enough to do it, uh, do outward offerings until recent years. And so it was just a massive opportunity for us to say, let's be a generous church and give outside of ourselves and, and do that to a greater extent. But the reason we've had to really be prayerful about it this year is because we've had four out of the nine months that we're through so far, four that are like record-breaking months of giving. It's just been just beautiful um, at how people have just been faithful to give, but five have been like really, really low. And so we're like, well, maybe, maybe this is a year that we should like reel back and not do an outward offering and just finish and just hit budget and that will be that will be awesome and that will be good and the more our leadership uh, council and our, our deacons and staff and everyone pray over it the more we just think no we we want to do an outward offering because we want to be a generous church we want to give outside of ourselves and so uh, we bring all that to you to just say we want you to pray over that as well as what end of year gifts can look like. And we just wanna put it on your radar ahead of time. So at this point in the year, year to date budget should be 1.6 million. And our income has been almost 1.5 million, making us behind budget 114K. Um, that's been something that the staff and the leaders, even in this room and, and others that are not in this room today, like have done really well to just adjust. And well, how do we do ministry different this time? How do we do that later? How do we hold off on this? And so ultimately we've kept our expenses down, but the net loss is 64K or so. So I say all that just to be transparent with you, but to also say, pray about that outward offering coming up in two weeks, that you might be a part of that, um, that you might give uh, to, to scenarios that are maybe outside of relationships that you have or anyone that you know, but you're gonna make a significant difference in the lives of those families who have genuinely lost almost everything in East Tennessee. And that you would prayerfully say, how do I do my part to help the end of your gifts uh, financially be strong and good so that we can continue doing ministries here the way that we are. So it's not anything that we're worried about as much as we just want God's church to show up and to have all the information so that you know what to do with that. So um, so we just want to take this chance right now to pray over both those offerings, but to also pray over you and all the stuff you walked in today with. Might be worried about certain things, concerned about certain things, have questions about the Bible. We're just really thrilled that you're here. And so let's just pray over all this stuff together and uh, we'll continue in worship, okay? Let's pray. Um, God, I thank you for what you're doing in our church family, how you aim to use us, Lord, to be hands and feet of Christ anywhere we go, everywhere we go. And even in some places, Lord, that, that we don't know uh, anyone, but, but we know devastation and we care about that and we pray about that. So God, I pray on this outward offering in two weeks that you would use this for your glory that people would see Christ and, and your church that loves well and cares well and that we're just growing in our own generosity as a church family to give outside of ourselves and to be people who, who just serve and give like that. And Lord, we wanna be responsible with our budget and with the things that we get to do within our community in Nashville, in our church family. And so Lord, we just ask you to work these parallel tracks, tracks out in a way that is, is God honoring and in a way that, that we all get to be participants in. So Lord, I thank you for what you're doing among us. We just ask for your glory to shine, even as we sing, as we pray, as we learn about the scriptures today. And if there's someone who's brand new today, I pray that they would feel welcomed and cared for because they deeply matter. It's in the name of Jesus we pray over all these things.
grateful your call on our lives into something greater ushering us into your presence that we would spend time with you that we weren't we'd learn to rest in you and depend on you that that the most restful and, and sweet times in our life are just sitting in your presence And God, I'm so thankful for your care in my life. I'm so thankful for your care over your people and over your children. I just ask today that you would stir our hearts with a deep love for you, a deep love for your word, a deep love to follow you as you call us into a deeper level of obedience, as you call us to pursue you with our whole lives, with our whole hearts, I just ask that that be true of us. Because you're worthy of it. You're worth it. So we praise you. We praise your name. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our King and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your singing this morning. Go ahead and grab a seat. You know, the Christian life brings about an unexpected turn in a culture of extremes. And what I mean is, if you, if you really describe the gospel of Jesus, you could describe it with the most extreme words that are so accurate. Like when you would say, the gospel is awesome. The gospel is life-changing. The gospel is radical and epic and revolutionary. Like These are accurate, extreme words that the gospel is transformative. It's innovative. Man, really accurate and extreme words. But the unexpected turn that we take with the gospel is that there's a meaningful word that needs to be thrown in the mix, and it's the word ordinary. That's a special word. So the gospel is all of those extreme thoughts, but it is also ordinary, meaning the reality of the Christian life is that God works through ordinary people in ordinary churches, doing ordinary things in order to accomplish his extraordinary plan. And that is just well worth us thinking about today because it may be the most beautiful part of what it means to live and walk the Christian life. If you think about Jesus, Jesus in extremities and in accuracy, God Almighty, He is God Almighty. But then when you think 
ordinary, he put on normal flesh, stayed nine months in his mother's womb, born in an ordinary way, born in a really ordinary place. And as the scripture says, he grew in wisdom and stature in an ordinary way, just like you and I can grow. This is fantastic. If you look at the early church, which is what we're going to spend a few weeks studying, it's born out of this miraculous movement of the Spirit of God indwelling believers. It's involving ordinary people, and it's involving their ordinary practices. In fact, last year, maybe you are part of our church then, but we, we spent a couple of months studying um, the 50 days between Passover, which is when Jesus resurrected from the dead, And 50 days later, Pentecost, which is when God's church was actually born. And we spent a couple months just studying what happened historically during those 50 days and what can happen in your life in 50 days. So we we studied that and our study ended. I don't expect you to remember this, but our study ended where I want you to open your Bibles today in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. This is what we ended with last year when we studied those 50 days. And it's also where we'll pick up today. It says, so those who accepted the apostle Peter's message, they were baptized. And that day, everybody, there were about 3,000 people added to them. I mean, extreme, miraculous. And so what you need to know, there's probably around 120 or so Christians at the time. Then the gospel of Jesus was preached on this particular day during the festival of Pentecost and 3,000 people who heard the gospel of Jesus believed and began to follow Jesus. And, and that, that was how God's incredible, unstoppable church was actually born. So if you're a Christ follower today, your roots find their way back to Pentecost in that way. And so the question is, well, what happened after all that, the miraculous movement of God that happened then? Well, these ordinary followers and the the early church that was an ordinary church just began to live out a Christian lifestyle in ordinary ways. And that reality sets the tone for every Christian today and every local church today. So the question is, well, what did they do? And and in full transparency, my intention was to study Acts 2, 42 through 47. But there is so much just in verse 42, unless you really want to miss lunch. I'm like, how about we save that for another day? And we'll only stay in verse 42, okay? So Acts 2, 42 is where we're going to be. I'll read it to you, but follow along and let's just soak this in, okay? It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Really ordinary, right? Just sounds like super ordinary stuff. They continuously devoted themselves to these ordinary yet really earnest things. So before we even get to those four things, the question that I want you to think about is, well, who is they? Like, who is the they in that scripture? Well, the they is, is 3,120 people who were saved, people who were Christ followers. They were following Jesus, right? So, so there's an obvious thing that I just need to help you acknowledge and to see before we even get into those four things that were to be about in our lives. The obvious but important thing to acknowledge is that the early church was made up of believers in Jesus. It was made up of a redeemed people who have been saved, And so to learn from the early church, it's really important that you and I see the principles that come out in Acts chapter 2 and we apply it appropriately to our lives. So I want to actually say it and write it and, and have you think of it in a personal way. So what that means, the they in that scripture means at TDF, we are a redeemed people. We are a redeemed people. Our local church is made up of ordinary people who have been miraculously saved. Like, like I could not have brought about salvation in my life on my own. It is God and God alone. It's the, the work and mercy of Jesus. And so we are miraculously saved, not because of ourselves and our works and our good deeds, but because of the gift of Christ 
And as believers who make up the church, the ecclesia, the, the church, the gathering of believers, of Christ followers, we are also Christ followers, even today and every day that we gather, that, that acknowledge, hey, there are unbelievers among us, people who have questions about the Bible and faith and worldviews and, and about Jesus among us. And we think about those people as, as compassionate friends who are searching for truth in the same way that we have searched for truth. That's the way we view it. And so the church describes the redeemed. It describes the saved, people who authentically and personally know Jesus Christ, not just about him, but we know him. And it's a group of people who long for every unbeliever here to know him too, truly and fully to know him. So it's why anytime I, I would ever share God's word in a setting like this, I'm preaching to and for God's church, knowing that unbelievers who are inquiring of the things of God are listening in. And if you are an unbeliever today, I just want you to know, we are so thrilled that you're here. Searching out the scriptures and searching out who Jesus is is so important. So as, as the redeemed people, the early church, as, as people who follow Jesus, what are they trying to be devoted to? And they're ordinary things, but they're also profound. So again, we personalize it because God intends us to follow suit, right? So at TDF, we are a redeemed people committed to the first thing that Luke says, sound doctrine, sound doctrine. Doctrine is just belief. It's teaching. It's, it's worldview. It's all of that, but sound doctrine. So the way Luke writes it is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which means we, as modern-day believers, we get this tremendous gift of the Scriptures, the New Testament that incorporates the apostles' teaching as they also reflect on the value and worth of the Old Testament. And so in the Old and New Testaments, we have the full canon of Scripture that we believe this to be God's word. And so we are trying to commit ourselves to God's word, the, the study of biblical truth. The only thing we ever want you to chase after is what is true. And we think as you pursue truth, you will have to bump up against what will I do with Jesus who seems to be the truth. And so we, we just ask you to chase after that. And in that way, in the most unremarkable way, every pastor and every believer should be seen as someone with unoriginal content. If I bring you original doctrine today, I actually think it should scare you a little bit. Because if, if it's just out of my mind and out of my heart and it's doctrine that I would come up with in reality, I just don't think that's good enough for what you need in your life. It will not hold up. As, as much as I have affection for you and care for you, it won't hold up. And so we, we're aiming to study God's word. We're aiming to be people who learn God's word, who obey God's word, who grow, not just in knowledge of God's word, but who know how to grow in spiritual discernment, meaning what do I do with knowledge of God's word? And, and the point is when we get away from sound doctrine, the reality is we resemble a, a broken church. And churches sadly do this sometimes. And in fact, there's, there's a, a group of churches written about in Revelation 2 that Jesus himself writes a letter through the Apostle John to speak to these churches. And one of them is the church of Pergamum in Revelation 2 where Jesus is saying, hey, you've gotten away from sound doctrine. And so he says it like this. He says, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites, to eat meat, sacrifice to idols, to commit sexual immorality, saying you've gotten off in your doctrine. It's not sound. It's not substantial anymore. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So repent, he says. Otherwise, I will come to you quickly and I will fight against this false doctrine with the sword of my mouth. So we're talking about a church, when you look at Pergamum, it's a church that's gotten away from the ordinary study of God's word. Like they've, they've begun to add things to it and 
take things away from it, just like we tend to do sometimes. They, they have, in, in the most simplistic way, they've blurred the lines of reality and of false teaching. So I want you to see that what we are called to live like as Jesus followers, we're called to live as people who are discipling others in sound doctrine and to, to be discipled in sound doctrine. So we absorb sound doctrine, not to just soak it up, but the deeper calling is to then disciple other people with the sound doctrine that we gravitate to and that we've been blessed with. So the way Paul says it in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says, what you've heard from me, Timothy, in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So the thought, he's saying, Timothy, look, you've been discipled by me, meaning I've, I've expressed sound doctrine with my words, but I've also tried to help you understand how to live it. And I'm imperfect and I'm a sinner, so I'm not great at it, but I'm walking with Jesus and I want you to walk with Jesus. And so I'm doing this, I'm discipling you. So Timothy, you need to disciple faithful people so that they can disciple faithful people. One of my friends said the other day to me, and I'm like, man, you're so right. He said, Tommy, when you talk about making disciples who make disciples, it's really that second part that's key, isn't it? Instead of just being a person who soaks in sound doctrine, the deeper, more profound calling is to say, I soak in sound doctrine so that I can walk it out and help others walk it out. That is the calling on every Christ follower's life. And so, in 1 Peter 2, it says, like newborn infants desire the pure milk of the word so that by it, and I love this phrase, you may grow up into your salvation. So he's just saying spiritual growth comes from growing up in sound doctrine and helping others do the same. He's saying, I want you to grow up in your faith. And you might be like, Tommy, I know nothing about Jesus, but I really do want to grow. It's like you're drinking milk. You're like, this, this is, tastes good, it tastes right, like this, this is sustaining, but as you grow in your faith, it'll begin to be like, like I'm eating a little bit. Now I'm, now I'm eating meat, and it's not that I'm growing in arrogance, it's that I'm just spiritually growing in my walk with God, but I've never really changed from the desperation that I need Him. I'm just growing up in my salvation. You see that? So back at verse 42, he says, here are the ordinary things that they were about. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, but also to fellowship. Fellowship. Meaning, at TDF, we are a redeemed people committed to sharing our lives together. Together. You may have wondered, like, what does the Donaldson Fellowship mean? Like, that word, that just sounds so churchy. I don't, I don't even get what that means. The Christian life is meant to be full of fellowship. Fellowship just meaning to share our lives together as participants in the gospel. Not as people who just come and observe the gospel, but we participate in the gospel. That we're people who, who own our faith like that. And so the, the reality is, we share a savior. We share the scriptures. We share the same salvation. We share the same desire to worship the one true God. And yes, we share in the same struggles, but we also share in the same victories. We share, we have so much in common. Despite our diversity and despite our backgrounds, we have so much in common. So an ordinary church is not meant to be an event where people just come and they just observe and they watch. That is not the ecclesia, the church. The church is a fellowship of global believers and especially local believers. So, so if I were to just be as forthright as I can to help you understand what that means, that means a Christian who is not plugged in to a local church, that person is actually a spiritual orphan. They are floating alone. Like if you've ever just thought, like I can do this on my own, I read a little bit of the Bible, but I, I, don't, really, I don't really like interact with God's church. I'm not really worshiping with other people. I'm not really doing that. I'm just kinda, I kind of pop in, pop out, kind of do my thing on my own. Like, man, that is not what Hebrews 10 is talking about. Hebrews 10 says, let us consider one another. 
Meaning like, hey, think about me and I want to think about you. Why? In order to provoke love and good works among us, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing. He's like, look, I know it's easy to get out of the habit of gathering together. I get it. I know it. But you need that gathering to provoke each other to love and good works and to encourage each other and all the more to be about those things as you see the day that Jesus will return approaching. So Christians are meant to help each other know how to love well, to help each other learn how to accomplish good works, to encourage each other. When we come together, even like this today, we're coming together to be known and to know each other. We're committed He's saying to sound doctrine. It sounds so ordinary, but it is really remarkably beautiful. We're committed to sharing our lives together, open, honest, and vulnerable. But I need you to know who I really am and what I really struggle with. And you need the same thing. And then we, we come to a point in verse 42 where Luke says, we're committed to the breaking of bread. What does that mean? Well, it, it probably makes you think of communion. It makes you think of the Lord's Supper, which is one of the symbols for our unity. But in a greater sense, he's talking about something even, even bigger picture than that, that at TDF, we are a redeemed people committed to clinging to the cross of Christ. So that incorporates the Lord's Supper. That incorporates communion. But Luke is talking about, and think about this, that even from the beginning of the church, like they're months out, they're years out. It's not hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Like even them being so close to when Jesus was crucified, Christians were reminding each other at the birth of the church, hey, we need to be people who always look back and who always remember what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. Remembering may seem so not extraordinary. Unless you have a bad memory, then you're like, no, no, no. It is really extraordinary in my life to remember anything. But in this way, it's very ordinary to just think back at something, to remember something. And he's saying, listen, this is to be a part of the, the church, not just the early church, but every local body to remember and to be devoted to that and to feast on the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. So when we take communion and when we gather like that, when we think of the cross, we think of a broken body represented in the bread and we think about the shed blood of Jesus represented with the cup. It just reflects what Jesus said about himself in John 6 when he said, I am the bread of life. No one will come to me. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. And so what, what I'm telling you is we cling to the cross of Christ, communing, yes, around the Lord's table, but it, to an even greater lifestyle, our unity in Christ is symbolized in that cross. It's more than jewelry. And it's more than something on the side of a building. And it's more than something in a logo. The cross of Christ has brought about peace in my life when all I had was war against God. The cross of Christ like, reconciled us to God and believe it or not, like to each other. As sisters and brothers in Christ, we're reconciled because of the cross. So the cross is the symbol of our fellowship of our community, of who we are together. So, so at TDF, in this one verse, it's so awesome. We are a redeemed people, totally committed to sound doctrine. I just want to speak truth to you. I want to preach truth to you. You don't have time for any falsehoods and any other narratives. We're committed to sound doctrine. We're committed to sharing our lives together. We're committed to clinging to the cross of Christ, and we're committed to intentional prayer. So the apostles were promised by Jesus something that may sound like, ooh, ooh, this is, this is like a gotcha kind of Jesus moment. But Jesus handles it so well. He, he promises something in the upper room that holds strong for us today. That you just need to understand it in context. John 14, he says to his disciples, whatever you ask in my name, meaning when you talk, when you pray, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And that may make you think at first, like, oh, like, 
genie in a bottle kind of stuff. Like, this is like, wow, I can like control God. But you know, throughout the scriptures, like, God is not put in my box or yours. He ferociously upends all of that. And so the good news of what Jesus is communicating is, hey, whatever you ask in my name, in the name of Jesus, and according to the will of God, he says, I'll do it. I will be about that. And verse 42 is, is really beautiful because it doesn't just mean we're committed to, to being people who pray. The literal translation of that phrase is that we would be committed to the prayers meaning we're committed to, to prayer gatherings. We're committed to praying with each other and for each other. And, and that's why we often say here that prayer is our greatest ministry because we should be having prayer gatherings and prayer meetings all the time. In smaller groups and larger groups, it's why we do midweek prayer every Wednesday night. Like all these things are just really, really important. And if you know that prayer gatherings in the West they are actually not the most popular gathering of the week, believe it or not. They're not. But if you research the global south and if you research the east, in almost all of those local churches, we have so much to learn about prayer and fasting from them because it is a must in those local churches, even today. It is a must to them because it's like they, they've gathered together to proclaim their dependency on the God of heaven in order for them to see any miraculous things done among them. And in fact, it, it is really precious when you hear like African sisters and brothers talk about prayer. So often the word that I hear tagged on to the front end of it, and it's worth mentioning this because of how this sermon is framed, they will say we're devoted to extraordinary prayer. And they don't mean extraordinary like in those extreme words like I was talking. They mean it like it is just extra ordinary prayer. Like it is qualitatively and quantitatively more. So I don't just pray for my keys. Where'd my wallet go? I don't just pray for that. I do pray for that. And you should pray for that. But it's not just that. They say the quality of what we pray for is different. In addition to that, we pray for the nations to come to Christ. We pray for people who need healing. We pray for uh, my son or my daughter who is really walking away from the Lord. We pray for them to hear the sweet voice of God, the God who created them, to call them to himself and for them to say yes and repent and draw to the Lord. Like We pray over a, a qualitatively better set of prayers. We just pray more qualitatively, but we also pray more quantitatively. We just, we just gather more for prayer. I pray more for you. We pray more together. And so what, what I'm just blown away by and inspired by God's global church is something that I just feel like as an American, maybe as a room of mostly Americans, that we really do need to think about how to be more focused in our prayers, how to pray more often. And I just think knowing that God's global church does that so much better than we do, so much more focused in that, I think it should just cause us to pause and just ask God what we should do with it. That's all. God, what should we do with that? And so the, the power and the glory seen in the early church, this historical church that's being birthed, it really flows from ordinary people who authentically know Jesus Christ. They know him, they walk with him, and they're committed to internalize and share sound doctrine. They're committed that we're going to share our lives together, open, honest, vulnerable together. They're committed to clinging to the cross of Christ. I need the cross more than I need that, that job or that money or that power, or that accolade. I need the cross. I need that. I need to remember the cross and what it means in my life. And I desperately need to intentionally pray. So here's the way this verse works in God's kingdom. An ordinary Christian life equals extraordinary kingdom impact. What is ordinary this week? That we're going to walk with friends and we're going to go to work and we're going to gather in Bible studies and we're going to pray and we're going to put our kids to bed and love them well and we're going to we're going to do whatever that, that it is that we will do this week. But but an ordinary Christian life. 
when you devote ordinary things to God and you walk it out, we're devoted to these things, we're committed to these types of things, it becomes extraordinary kingdom impact. And you know what's gonna begin to happen? Not only in your family or in your friendships, but also in our church family. It may be a month, it may be months, it may be years, but we're gonna look around at some point and go, hey, look at the incredible work of God in this ordinary church. And we'll love the ordinary part of that. We'll like say, wow, God, like you did that even in us. We struggle with so much stuff, but you did it in us. And it's your extraordinary ways. Of course you would use ordinary vessels like us to bring that kind of thing about. And so the question for you may be like, well, cool, but where do I start? Like, where do I begin? Well, let me just keep the same pattern as that scripture. Are you saved? If you say, Tommy, I don't know Christ personally. I've never repented of my sin. I've never surrendered my life to Jesus. I've never done that. That's the starting point. That is the starting point. That is a beautiful starting point for you to realize I am a sinner. I don't know how to fix my life. I don't have anything under control. But this God of heaven sent Jesus to die on the cross for me that I might have new life if I would receive that gift of salvation. So today, today, I'm inviting you, accept Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Repent of your sins. Be counted among the redeemed, not people who've earned a thing or who know more, but it's just that Jesus has saved us. Man, so that's the starting point. If you're already saved, my question is, are you being discipled? Or if you're being discipled, have you, have you even thought about discipling someone else? Because that might very well be the best next step. Are, are you, maybe a best next step is, are you authentically known? And are you authentically living in community with God's church? Just being vulnerable about the things you struggle with and your problems and your concerns and what you've got rolling around in your head that you just have never shared with anybody. Are you living vulnerably among God's church like that? Maybe a next step for you is to cling to the cross of Christ more than all that other stuff you're being tempted to chase. But I'm going to cling to the cross. I'm going to remember. I'm going to be more desperate for the cross every day of my life. Or maybe a, a next step is for you to finally become dependent on the Lord and to begin to pray more often and gather with people to pray and pray, pray immediately, pray over them now instead of just talking about praying for them one day. I don't know what your next step is, but here's the reality, man. I really do trust the Spirit of God to lead all of us as individuals. Isn't that crazy? Like to think that God knows exactly what you need in a way that I is way out of my territory. And so we just pray and ask God to lead and to guide us trusting that he'll do it in an individual and collective way. So I'm just going to ask you to stand to your feet, if you don't mind, and we'll pray over all this together. Mm. Father God, I thank you for the scriptures and how much I am learning, God, about you and about your heart for humanity, about how I don't have to have it all figured out and I don't have to pretend like I'm sinless and, and I'm just like this perfect pastor. God, I don't have to do any of that because it's just not true. It's just not true. I desperately need you. And I pray, Lord, that, that if there's anyone here who has never surrendered their life to Jesus, that they would do that today. They would do that even right now as I'm talking to you, that they would talk to you and confess the sin in their life, but also confess that this great God of heaven who created them and, and who has the ability to save them, if, if he'll do it, that they will receive him. So God, I pray that they'll be bold enough to accept Jesus as their Savior and their Lord, that they'll become a Christ follower, that they'll become redeemed, that they'll become part of your church. As imperfect as the church is and as imperfect as each of us are, that they'll become part of your plan to reach the nations with the gospel of Jesus. And Lord, for every Christ follower here, I pray that they would give up idols and, and other doctrine that is not sound. It is very much man-made, and it's not good enough. But I pray that they would give that up and really lean into these very ordinary things that the early church made a big deal. Lord, help us to not feel like we matured past it. Help us to really look toward these things as core tenets, as pillars of our faith that should describe our local church as well. So Lord, lead us, guide us. As we sing, help it to be an overflow of 
lives that really do worship you. God, we're just grateful. So please lead us and guide us today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, this song is new to us as a congregation, but many of you probably know it. And it's just an opportunity for us to have a personal, individual moment with the Lord and just give Him praise and glory and gratitude for all that He is and all that He's done for us. So let's do that together, church. Oh, my words fall short. I got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? And I could sing these songs as I often do. But every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing It's not 
not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing. to your name, calling out to your name with everything that we are and everything that we do. God, that you've called us into something deeper. I pray that our hearts be set on you, our eyes fixed on you. And as we walk through this week, that you would be made much of, that our lives would reflect you as our creator, the one who is worthy to receive glory and honor and power forever, for you are holy. May that song be on our lips always. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. Y'all are dismissed. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Let's do it.